Hi, I'm joined today by Dr. Bill Rudd. It's good to see you, Bill. We have a, a course uh, called Gender Equality in Ministry, uh, and it really stems from Bill's book, uh, Should Women Be Pastors and Leaders? Uh, and the obvious answer to that for some Christians is obviously not. No, they shouldn't be. Um, but I have a suspicion that Dr. Bill Rudd actually believed that himself at one time. And this is what makes this course particularly interesting. And so, Bill, could you maybe describe to us your own personal journey from saying no to women in ministry and in leadership uh, and now saying a very distinct yes? Thank you. Well, for probably about 45 years of my pastoral ministry, my answer to the question, should women be pastors and leaders in church, would have been, uh, I hope, a, a gentle but strong no. <laughs> I'd like to think I was a gentle complementarianism, but that would be self-deceptive. Uh, but because I knew this was an issue, periodically I would uh, kind of say, well, I probably should check to make sure I'm right, especially when I'd see perhaps a new book that came out uh, arguing that the answer was yes, uh, an egalitarian position. And typically I would read the book and then put it down and say, I don't have to worry about changing my position. And my, I would feel like the author was just trying to be politically correct. Uh, and they didn't really deal with the scriptures, which of course for us is the key issue. What does the scripture say uh, about it? And then uh, someone said to me, uh, I, I know that this has been a point of interest to you times and I know how you feel about the books you've read but uh, I found a book that the author takes a different position than yours but he really takes the scriptures very seriously and the book is full of exegesis and the original languages and so I thought to be integrous I probably should take a look at it it was uh, one of Stanley Gren's books and uh, it was stunning because uh, he was not just trying to be politically correct. He was dealing with the text. And he was calling my attention to things in the text that somehow I had never looked at. And frankly, uh, I think this was an area where because the English translations, most of them and the ones that I used, seemed like they were so clear in a couple of the key passages in First Timothy 2 and First Corinthians 14, that I never did the kind of exegetical work that I did with every sermon I preached. I hadn't really seriously looked at the Greek words and what they meant and what they were housed in other biblical contexts. I hadn't looked hard at those two passages uh, and looked at the theme of the chapter and the book or the historical background or the cultural background. And so I was kind of forced to say, wow, I better look at this more carefully. And that launched me into a multi-year uh, journey, obviously because of all of the busyness of life and ministry, I couldn't put it totally on the front burner. So it stretched out over a number of years and I was studying the scriptures, you know, just on their own. I was reading on both sides of the question because I wanted my thinking to be challenged by views of both ways. And uh, as I came, was coming very close to a, a conclusion and being in a place of having to say, I'm so sorry, I was wrong, and here's why. We were at a particular point in the life of our church when I challenged our staff and elders to consider making a study of this question together and mapped out uh, what that study might look like. And so we <clears throat> spent six months as a, as a team uh, of the staff and as our lay elders looking at this topic together and we would make assignments for different ones to make presentations about different passages or aspects of the question and then we'd discuss it and so during that time it was just crystallizing and reaffirming what I'd been finding and the the white papers that I prepared for that study that we were making you know doing theology and community which I don't think we do enough of uh, actually, those white papers became the basis of the book that I then wrote over a course of several years in which uh, I was forced by the scriptures to say, should women be pastors and leaders in church? Resoundingly, yes. And uh, I realized then how many parts of the scripture 
I had interpreted through my bias and I had read things into the text, especially in Genesis uh, chapter one and two and three and how I was kind of like a kitten whose eyes were coming open and uh, seeing the scriptures in a whole different way because I'd taken off my prejudice glasses. Uh, and Bill, what was the sort of response from others that you were contemporary with in ministry in relation <laughs> to the change of position? Well, probably unsurprisingly, <laughs> it was mixed, but most more in a certain direction. There were, of course, people who were thrilled. You know, maybe many of them had been closet <laughs> uh, egalitarians uh, because it just wasn't acceptable to speak otherwise. And certainly there are people who didn't have a strong opinion, but were very open and appreciated the study. But uh, unsurprisingly, uh, dear friends, especially ministry friends, pastors, uh, a majority responded initially very negatively. And what was frustrating to me, and, I, and if I know my heart, it had nothing to do with my wanting to sell books. But uh, I was stunned by the number of people who said, uh, this is heresy, I don't even need to read your book. You know, the scriptures are so clear on this. And uh, I would do my best to try to say, please just look at it and uh, interact with me about whether I've exegeted the scriptures correctly. And uh, so many of them were unwilling even to engage at any level because they were so strongly committed to uh, their position. And I understand that. I held that position for more than four decades and I accepted what I'd been taught. I accepted what appeared on the surface of the text to be there. I was able then to brush aside anything else in Scripture that might have challenged in those passages. And uh, I have to this day written me off, uh, who had been lifetime friends. And of course, now they're expecting that I become theologically liberal and unorthodox in lots of other areas because I've opened the door. And the accusations were you, wanna, you just want to please people, you want to be politically correct. Uh, that kind of response. So that, that was disappointing. But again, I have to try not to be too harsh because of my own journey and how long it took me for me to look. Now, it does seem, Bill, within the American context uh, that mm -hmm. uh, opinion is very, very divided uh, between egalitarianism and complementarianism. Uh, if you look at social media at all, some of the comments are uncharitable. Uh, it seemed very unkind in relation to, to how they conduct the debate or discussion. What would your advice be and your stance be in meaningful dialogue about these two positions? Uh, wow. If I had been more successful in getting more <laughs> uh, that kind of dialogue, I'd probably have some better answers for you. I think uh, it's important to try to maintain humility and uh, be able to acknowledge, you know, I shouldn't expect everyone to suddenly adopt my understanding of the scriptures because I have done so and realize how long it took me. Uh, trying perhaps in a dialogue to not get to the political aspects, those kinds of things, but to really try to point people to the text. And uh, Jesus, of course, was a master at asking questions. And so I think that's a great approach, is to ask questions. Uh, simple things like in 1 Timothy chapter 2, why does Paul choose a, a highly unusual word for authority? And uh, why within the text are the same Greek words translated very differently in most translations? And uh, in, in earlier verses in the same chapter, they obviously mean something different than what the same word is used in the gender part of the passage. And just trying to ask questions to arouse curiosity and see if people would be willing to at least look and engage. It's been hard. Bill, on this course, I'm sure there'll be those that are both egalitarian and complementarian. Yes. Uh, what would you say to them uh, if, they're ta if they take a different viewpoint to that of your own? Oh, I, I just would be thrilled if they'll take the course 
And uh, as you know, in the bibliography, I include works on both sides of the question, the, the pro-complementarian and the pro-egalitarian, because the last thing I would advise would be for people to just look at one side of the question. That's, that's what I had done. And if my new position can't stand up against the strong complementarian position, then it's not a good position. So I would, I would hope that people would, you know, take the class with an open mind, look at the things that are presented, but also they certainly are not going to be graded on whether they agree with the professor in their conclusion. And I ask them, for example, in one of the papers to describe both positions and the arguments in favor of them. Because if I can't state my opponent's position in a way that they would agree with, I'm really not ready for the debate yet. Okay. Dr. Bell Rudd, thanks very much for your introduction to the course today. I'm sure that those who are going to take this course will thoroughly enjoy it. I hope it challenges them and I hope we keep on learning. So Dr. Bell Rudd, thank, thank you, so, you much so much for joining us today. Thank you.